welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, CNS seminar. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Naomi Eagle. Uh, she did her uh, PhD in government at uh, Cornell University. Uh, she's spending this year as a nuclear security postdoctoral fellow up at Stanford at CSAC, the Center for International Security and Cooperation. Um, she's also going to be gainfully employed uh, in the fall. She'll be starting a assistant professor position at the University of Georgia in Athens. Uh, she's been published uh, in a bunch of places, Journal of Politics, European Journal of International Relations, uh, Research in Politics, uh, Washington Quarterly and War on the Rocks, uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, among others. Uh, and she's going to be talking to us today about weapons governance by the week. So it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that introduction. Thank you for being here in person or on Zoom. I'm really happy to be here. Um, as some of you know, but probably not all, I got my start in this field through a CNS summer internship and really credit Bill and Masako with helping me get started working on nuclear issues. So today I'll be presenting a portion of my broader book project. And for today's presentation, I wanna start by going to the United Nations in July, 2017. And what we see here are delegates from over 120 countries celebrating a brand new treaty they just passed banning nuclear weapons. What we don't see in this photo, however, are any delegates from nuclear weapon states. You can see on the right that the United Kingdom's chair is empty. I was there though. And <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may see yourselves in this photo. <laughs> um, but on a bigger question, it's puzzling why delegates from so many countries would be celebrating a treaty banning nuclear weapons that lacks the participation of any nuclear weapon state. In order to understand why everyone is in this picture is celebrating this treaty, we need to understand how they got there. Now, for those who are familiar with this treaty, you'll note that this was not the first time that smaller states had developed a treaty banning weapons without the support of great powers. Here we see in 1997, Canadian Foreign Minister Lloyd Axworthy signing the Mine Ban Treaty as UN Secretary General Kofi Annan watches. And we can think about other examples like the 2008 Cluster Munitions Convention or the 1967 Latin American Nuclear Weapon Free Zone as other instances of agreements that were governing weapons that weren't necessarily led by great powers. So the question that I'm going to answer and first ask in today's <laughs> presentation um, is why and how do small and medium states pursue multilateral weapons governance? And I'll focus on this primarily through a case study of the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, but I'll also discuss a little bit the 1980 Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons as a case where um, some of the motivations were the same, but the process and outcome were quite different. Now, I mean, why you don't call them non-nuclear weapon states? Why do you use the term small and medium? I'm so glad you asked. Um, I'm using this term of multilateral weapons governance to refer to both nuclear and non-nuclear agreements. So this is not just about nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, but about states that are both don't possess nuclear weapons, but also don't dominate the global arms trade, aren't acknowledged as a P5 with the right of veto. Um, so this, but I appreciate the question because although I'm talking about the TPNW today, it is also intended to be broader than nuclear governance alone. Yeah. Um, and so I'm referring by multilateral weapons governance to international agreements, whether legally binding treaties or informal political agreements that govern all aspects associated with all types of weapons. Um, and other people might subset it, this into disarmament, non-proliferation, arms control, export controls. I'm grouping these together under a broader category of weapons governance um, because as we'll get to in a little bit, these all concern governance of the tools that states can use to provide for their security and threaten that of others. And it's important to understand weapons governance by smaller states because agreements led by these kinds of states actually account for a large proportion of weapons governance overall. This figure draws on a data set I developed of all multilateral weapons governance agreements since the end of World War II. And we can see that agreements led by great powers are the most frequent kind of agreement, but still account for less than half of all agreements. So if we're focusing only or primarily on what great powers are doing, we're missing a lot of what's going on. And so what do we know about multilateral weapons governance? 
We have a lot of wonderful scholarship already, including by people in this room. Um, but most, most scholarship, although not all, um, tends to focus on agreements led by great powers. And this is especially true when looking at agreements governing nuclear weapons. But as we know from the figure I just showed, agreements led by great powers account for less than half of all agreements. And so while this is important, of course, to understand what great powers are doing and agreements led by great powers, there's also a lot of other agreements going on as well. We do have scholarship on some of these agreements about the landmine treaty, cluster munitions convention, some recent work on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. But the scholarship often contains an assumption, either explicit or explicit, that these are just good things to do, that who wouldn't want to ban landmines? And in doing so tends to not really unpack the strategic motivations behind why smaller states would pursue these agreements and, and incur the costs and risks of going against great powers at times to do so. So to explain why smaller states pursue multilateral weapons governance, I contend that they do so for two primary reasons. First, to reduce their vulnerability to great powers. As many are familiar with this photo, it's a photo of a US nuclear weapons test over Bikini Atoll. And this was over to 75 years ago, but Micronesia today still suffers heavily from the effects of nuclear testing, including heavily contaminated soil and water, high rates of cancer, population displacement, and although most states aren't quite as small as Micronesia, still, given their relatively limited resources, smaller states are far less able to insulate or protect or defend themselves from the use of destructive weapons than great powers are. And this is both with regard to nuclear and non-nuclear weapons. And great powers dominance in the production, possession, and potential use of many weapons of war threatens smaller state security. But smaller states are also vulnerable to great powers authority in international relations. Great powers military, economic, and social dominance facilitate their ability to make rules for smaller states that reinforce or increase asymmetries between great powers and the rest. And so creating multilateral rules for regulating weapons provides smaller states with an especially important way to limit their vulnerability to great powers because it's an effort to circumscribe both the military and social elements of great powers dominance by establishing collective rules that restrict their freedom of action. So I'm not saying that this is the only way that smaller states ever seek to reduce their vulnerability to great powers, but rather that making rules about the weapons that great powers can use to threaten smaller states is an especially important way of doing so. The second reason why smaller states pursue multilateral weapons governance is to increase their agency and influence. Agency refers to freedom from subjugation, the ability to chart an independent course of action. Think about it as power to, not just power over. And in seeking agency and influence, smaller states are attempting to reshape international relations to be less asymmetrically dominated by the concerns and priorities of great powers, and more so by their own concerns and priorities. That is, they're seeking to challenge the international hierarchy that affords great powers, special rights and privileges, and claim a greater role for themselves in international rulemaking. And these questions of agency and influence are especially salient in weapons governance, both because military capabilities are such an asymmetric element of relations between states, but also because they're so central to the modern state system that the right to self-defense is in the UN charter and the exclusive authority on um, military force is part of state sovereignty. And so making rules about the tools that states can use to provide for their security and threaten that of others is really central to international relations more broadly. Of course, having these goals is not the same as having an agreement that reflects and advances these goals. And so I contend that there's three key elements in the process leading to an agreement that are necessary for smaller states to actually create an agreement that can reflect and advance their goals. The first is reframing weapons and authoritatively reframing weapons. In international negotiations, frames shape or limit the scope of an issue. They legitimize certain solutions while delegitimizing others. And so framing weapons in a way that centers small and state, medium states goals is necessary to create an agreement that's actually aimed at addressing them. So specifically, smaller states are going to frame weapons in terms of their destructive effects, especially their humanitarian effects. Framing weapons in this way centers their vulnerability, legitimizing and prioritizing a response aimed at reducing their vulnerability while delegitimizing responses that aren't aimed at addressing it. So for example, framing weapons in terms of their humanitarian effects makes far less relevant the question of whether a certain agreement is going to advance strategic stability or not. 
And I want to be clear that I'm not saying that there's no genuine humanitarian concern about nuclear or other weapons, but rather that this is also a strategic framing to produce certain results and not solely reducible to humanitarianism in the sense of altruism. I also want to note that although we often think about humanitarian disarmament as sort of a post-Cold War phenomenon, um, there's actually a lot, a growing body of evidence that suggests that this goes back much further. And I certainly find evidence of this in my own work. Um, Teresa Dunworth also has a really excellent new book that shows the much longer legacy of framing weapons and concerns about war in a humanitarian sense um, to achieve certain outcomes. Whose book is that? Teresa Dunworth. Um, I'll write it for you after and send it to you. And this framing is attempting to emphasize the source of the problem with great powers that produce, export, and I'll use the weapon in question rather than with smaller states. It's an attempt to delegitimize and stigmatize great powers' possession of weapons and shift the burden of proof to them and force them to demonstrate that the weapon in question is in fact appropriate. And this matters because even when states oppose an actual agreement, they may still justify their actions or their possession of certain capabilities in this frame, legitimizing um, the goals behind the agreement. The second key element in getting from goals to an agreement is building support. All multilateral agreements, by definition of being multilateral, require support from multiple states, but smaller states lack the material and social dominance that great powers have to induce other states to join their initiatives. And Rebecca Gibbons has a great new book that shows the tools through which the United States has used to induce, coerce, or bribe, or otherwise get states to join the NPT. And smaller states, in contrast, lack a lot of the tools that feature really centrally for the United States. And so instead, smaller states attempt to build support through collective power based on recruiting as many small states as possible to serve as a counterweight to opposition of potentially more powerful states. So this is an illustration of the classic analogy for small states in world politics, the Lilliputians tying down Gulliver. Gotta have a picture in there somewhere. Um, he's of course much larger than they are, much more powerful. They're very small, but they succeed in working together. They tie him down and he has to agree to their demands. The third key element in getting from goals to an agreement is controlling the institutional format. Institutional formats differ in the actors and agendas they privilege and many awards special privileges, both formal and informal to great powers. We can think about the UN Security Council as formal privileges. We can also think about, of course, the NPT and its distinction between the five recognized nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, and states that are not recognized in the NPT as nuclear weapon states. So to create agreements that actually increase their agency and influence, smaller states need to avoid institutional formats that replicate or entrench inequalities. So instead, they're going to choose institutional formats that operate via procedural equality, so one state, one vote, no weighted voting, and make decisions by majority rather than requiring consensus. And so this is where building support is especially important because being able to vote by majority means that no single state or small group of states, no matter how powerful, no matter what weapons they possess, can block the will of the majority. When smaller states succeed in controlling the process in these ways, agreements tend to have a few common features. First, they tend to be legally binding treaties rather than informal political agreements. This is because for smaller states that lack great powers material resources, International law takes on heightened importance as a tool for exercising agency and influence internationally. This is because legally binding treaties can empower smaller states by not just making rules for states that sign up to them, but providing a foundation for new legal norms. Second, perhaps unsurprisingly, agreements led by smaller states tend to place the bulk of obligations and restrictions on great powers rather than on themselves. Perhaps a bit self-evident. But third, and I think this is crucial here, smaller states are reflecting their efforts to transform international relations through the development of these agreements. Smaller states tend to characterize these agreements as contributing to the development of new norms rather than codifying existing norms. And what this means is that even if great powers don't initially support an agreement, smaller states still will treat these as important steps and as successes in building support for a new norm and expect that the importance and influence will continue to grow over time. So now I'm gonna to turn to the case. I know many people are already quite familiar with the TPNW, so I won't spend time sort of going over the history of the TPNW. Um, 
But I'll just note that we can see on this map of states that participated in the negotiations, they're all small and medium states. They're also mostly states in the global south. And I use the case of the TPNW both because it's important in its own right, but also because it's representative of broader trends in weapons governance by smaller states. If we go back to the data set I introduced earlier, we can see on the right that nearly all agreements led by smaller states are legally binding treaties. That's very much not the case for agreements led by great powers or cases of mixed leadership. Additionally, if we look at the type of weapon under regulation, agreements led by smaller states are quite varied in the type of weapon they're focused on, but tend to focus on either nuclear weapons or small arms and light weapons. I use a case governing nuclear weapons because in another chapter, I examine a case governing nuclear weapons led by great powers. So there's a nice paired comparison here. I'm gonna focus on the TPNW, but I will talk a little bit about the 1980 Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, um, which I code as a case of mixed leadership. And we can see here that most cases of mixed leadership involve governance of conventional weapons. For the TPNW case, I draw on interviews I conducted with diplomats, international organization bureaucrats, and civil society participants involved in the process leading to the treaty. And I find strong evidence that smaller states were motivated to pursue the treaty to reduce their vulnerability to great powers, that they drew direct links between great powers possession of nuclear weapons and how this threatened the security of smaller states worldwide. And by emphasizing how nuclear weapons undermine rather than advanced international security, smaller states pursuing this treaty were drawing on a different understanding of what security involves and where vulnerabilities come from than great powers were. So instead of great powers nuclear weapons providing security through deterrence, smaller states pursuing this treaty viewed great powers possession of nuclear weapons as instead threatening their security and making them vulnerable to the devastating effects of potential nuclear weapons use. But I also find that in articulating the need for a treaty banning nuclear weapons, smaller states very much emphasize the links between the political and military implications of great powers possession of nuclear weapons, how this threatened the security of smaller states worldwide while leaving them relatively powerless in existing institutions to do anything about it. So if we look at this quote from one diplomat, they start off by talking about the unilateral imposition of great power politics, the importance of international law and rules of conduct, so their political vulnerability. But then they connect it to the destruction of World War II, even though they weren't really directly affected, and the risk of mass bombardment of cities. So connecting the need for the treaty to both political vulnerability and the imposition of great power politics, but also very much the material vulnerability and the risk of mass bombardment. I also find evidence that smaller states pursued this treaty to increase their agency and influence. And although they didn't use those terms exactly, they repeatedly described it as giving them a greater voice in international relations. That the treaty, they viewed it as making rules, not just for nuclear weapons specifically, but international relations more broadly. That banning nuclear weapons was a way to limit the unchecked authority of great powers and place smaller states on a more equal footing. And many interviewees emphasized that this was an empowering process even before they were sure there was going to be a treaty. During the process leading to the treaty, the slogan, democracy has come to disarmament, became a rallying cry as a very explicit signal of the efforts to transform the status quo through pursuing this treaty. So in this interview from one diplomat, they connect the overlap between the NPT nuclear weapon states to the P5 and the broader global north, global south dynamic regarding resentment about who makes the rules. So they view the NPT and the need for a treaty banning nuclear weapons as not just about nuclear weapons specifically, but about broader relations between states as well. This interviewee says that our view is that nuclear weapons affect everyone, and it's not just for nuclear weapon states or NATO to decide on nuclear policies or how multilateralism deals with this, that small states have a voice. And just to go back a little bit in time, a few years in time, to the CCW, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. This was negotiated in the late, mid to late 1970s. Um, it restricts certain weapons deemed particularly inhumane, including napalm and other incendiary weapons, as well as anti-personal landmines. And it really grew out of both efforts to develop the additional protocols, the Geneva Conventions, but also smaller states' concern about great powers, use and export of a variety of conventional weapons, both the US use in the Vietnam War, as well as um, channeling 
many of these types of weapons to proxy wars, especially in Asia and Africa. And states in these regions were particularly vocal in the need to create a new agreement that would restrict great powers ability to use and export weapons that were particularly inhumane or that they saw as being used unfairly against them. Um, so these similar motivations about reducing vulnerability, having a greater role in rulemaking, that's um, smaller states in the non-aligned movement in particular really saw this as being part of Cold War geopolitics. And so we see very similar motivations in the process leading to the CCW as well, even though again, it's not about nuclear weapons. We'll now go to the process leading to the treaty and whether the expectations regarding framing, building support and the institutional format hold here as well. In the TPNW, I find strong evidence that smaller states framed nuclear weapons explicitly in terms of their humanitarian effects. And as some people in this room know very well, there were three conferences held in the lead up to the treaty that were explicitly focused on examining the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons. And these were incredibly important in building momentum for a treaty that would be aimed at addressing these humanitarian effects. And although there was genuine humanitarian concern about the destruction that nuclear use would cause, many in diplomats also emphasized that this was an intentional and strategic framing, that framing nuclear weapons as a humanitarian issue and explicitly not talking about them in terms of deterrence or strategic stability was an effort to shift authority from great powers that possess these weapons to those that were vulnerable to them. So as one person put it, the humanitarian frame affords power to states that are not materially powerful. And as a different interview put it, it cracks the inaccessibility of the issue. Everyone's security is at risk with nuclear weapons. The humanitarian frame turns the issue into a justice issue. So again, not to deny the genuine humanitarian concern involved about nuclear weapons, but to point out that there's also a strategic element to framing it in this way in order to build momentum and build support for an agreement that's aimed at reducing vulnerabilities by smaller states. I also find strong support that smaller states very much um, built a broad massive support among many smaller states. And they did so by connecting it to different regions experiences with the harmful effects of nuclear weapons, as well as previous initiatives led by smaller states to govern weapons that weren't so much about nuclear weapons, including the landmines and cluster munitions treaty, as well as nuclear weapon free zones, which we see here on this map in dark orange. And they also, I should say, they also emphasized existing bonds between smaller states that were less directly about weapons, including shared post-colonial non-aligned identities to build support as well. Third, regarding the institutional format, the mandate to negotiate a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons came from the General Assembly. This was not a consensus agreement. It was important that the General Assembly passed this by majority vote. And it was passed by a vote of 113 in favor, 35 against with 13 abstentions. And voting not by consensus, but by majority made it possible to achieve a mandate for negotiations. The negotiating sessions in 2017 also made the decision by majority. 124 states participated and the treaty was adopted on July 7, 2017 by a vote of 122 in favor, one abstention from Singapore and one vote against by the Netherlands, the only NATO member to attend. And this decision to eventually vote by majority rather than requiring consensus was an intentional strategy to achieve a treaty that advanced smaller states goals. And many of my interviewees were adamant that had the negotiations required consensus, there likely would not have been an agreed treaty. So this diplomat very much saw negotiating the treaty without the consensus rule as very much an intentional strategy to achieve a treaty that advanced smaller states goals, that it was a democratization of international relations to negotiate without the consensus rule. Now this process leading to the TPNW is very different than the process that led to the CCW in 1980. In that process, um, smaller states still did very much frame the, the weapons under consideration as a humanitarian issue, arguing that there was no use of napalm that could be humane, that napalm needed to be outright banned. Um, same thing with other kinds of weapons, including fuel air explosives, small caliber bullets, <coughs> certain kinds of landmines, um, weapons producing fragments not detectable by x-ray, which I can come back to in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> but they didn't succeed in authoritatively framing it in this way, that great powers, especially the United States, but Soviet Union as well, 
really pushed back that there was anything inherently inhumane about these weapons, that really it was a question of proper use, proper training of militaries, and that napalm was in fact in many circumstances more humane and more efficient than the alternatives to it. Now that's obviously very different than where we are today, um, but that was how they sought to frame it at that time. And that ultimately succeeded in persuading a large number of states, um, largely US allies, but some um, not some states beyond that as well. Smaller states advocating for more comprehensive bans on these weapons, primarily led by Sweden, and Switzerland, Austria, and Mexico, um, did succeed in building a broad mass of support, but they didn't succeed in controlling the institutional format for negotiations. That um, the negotiating sessions for this were based out of a mandate from the negotiations for the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions, and they followed rules of procedure that required consensus. And although smaller states did seek to take this to the General Assembly and succeeded in creating a General Assembly resolution condemning napalm, they were not able to create a mandate for standalone negotiations. And the United States very, very successfully lobbied for requiring consensus in order to participate in the negotiations. And so ultimately the treaty was passed um, through consensus, it's much weaker than what many smaller states had wanted it to be. It largely involves restrictions, not prohibitions, and it largely uh, only extends protections to civilians. Very few protections in the original treaty extended to combatants as well. So just to emphasize that although the goals may be similar, the process leading to it can look very different and the outcome can look very different. So let's contrast that to what the TPNW looks like. The TPNW is a legally binding treaty, we know, so is the CCW. Um, but I want to emphasize that for TPNW proponents, having a legally binding treaty was important to create an agreement that would actually advance their goals. So this interviewee says that for small states, international law is paramount. Political declarations are not seen as strong enough to safeguard the interests of small states. A different interviewee says more simply, we're firm believers in the international rule of law because it's the great equalizer in international relations. So again, this effort to reduce their vulnerability, increase their agency and influence through the form of the agreement as well. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the treaty places the bulk of obligations and restrictions on great powers should they join. It's primarily a prohibition treaty for most non-nuclear weapon states. It prohibits weapons they don't have and activities in which they don't engage. Finally, Proponents very much viewed this treaty as advancing a new norm and very much emphasize that its importance and influence will continue to grow. And many diplomats emphasized to me that they didn't have some naive belief that this treaty was going to lead to the P5 immediately giving up their nuclear weapons, but rather that they were playing a long game and creating a new norm stigmatizing nuclear weapons whose importance and influence would grow gradually over time. So that of course brings us to the question of what does the treaty actually do? As I'm sure everyone here knows, <laughs> P5 still have nuclear weapons. They have not reduced their arsenals in response to this treaty. But I would argue that there are some clear signals that indicate that they do view it as posing a threat to the status quo, indicating that the expectation that the treaty's influence may grow over time is not entirely misplaced. Immediately after the treaty negotiations concluded in 2017, the United States, the United Kingdom and France released this statement. It says among other things, that the, the treaty clearly disregards the realities of the international security environment, that accession is incompatible with nuclear deterrence, which has been essential to keeping the peace in Europe and North Asia for over 70 years, that a ban on nuclear weapons that doesn't address the security concerns that continue to make nuclear deterrence necessary cannot result in the elimination of a single nuclear weapon and will not enhance any country's security. And I put this quote up just to emphasize that um, I think it shows the extent to which the states pursuing this treaty are drawing on a very different understanding of what security involves, where vulnerabilities come from, and the role of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence in this than great powers are. And so it's perhaps not surprising that the TPNW doesn't address the security concerns that these states view continue to make nuclear deterrence necessary. And that if we're to assess the treaty based on whether it does these things, um, it's unlikely to, and we shouldn't be surprised that it doesn't. And so understanding why smaller states are pursuing this agreement, I think sheds light on why it doesn't do these things. 
They also released other statements, as did the Russian Federation, that blamed the treaty for creating divisions between states. But in doing so, their attempt to undermine it highlighted its significance and acknowledged that it posed a threat to the status quo. By devoting so much diplomatic attention to the treaty rather than just ignoring it, they sent a clear signal that it was an important new development. And the US, UK, and France in particular put substantial pressure on their allies, in the case of France, former colonies as well, to reject this treaty. This pressure, what one of my interviewees referred to as neo-colonial bullying, further revealed the extent to which they considered the treaty to be a threat. After all, if it doesn't change anything, why would it matter if Senegal joined, or the Marshall Islands joined, or even Norway joined? And as I think, um, I think a really remarkable example of the extent to which the US is concerned about this treaty, in the lead up to the treaty's entry into force in January, 2021, the US demarched all the countries that had ratified it to withdraw. And this is essentially unprecedented in multilateralism to do that. It didn't work, the treaty entered into force, no one withdrew, um, but it's a highly, highly unusual move and an extraordinarily display of US pressure on small states. Um, this was very silly. Do you know who actually instructed to, to go into that demarching? Do you know anything about what led to that? Um, um, silly. Some, but we'll talk later. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the US has been especially concerned that if the treaty successfully stigmatized nuclear weapons and any NATO member joined, that this could affect the US alliance system and could limit the US ability to employ these for deterrence. And I would say that that's not an entirely unreasonable concern that four NATO members, two NATO aspirants, one of which has since joined NATO, attended the first meeting of states parties. They attended as observers. They did not indicate an intent to sign and ratify the treaty, but it's still a good faith engagement with the treaty. Um, and I would say that the treaty's future um, for NATO in particular and for European states outside of NATO as well um, is something that's important to watch in the future. So I'm gonna wrap up here, but I'd like to leave you with a few takeaways. First, that smaller states are active in multilateral weapons governance. And when we focus primarily or exclusively on what great powers are doing, we not only miss a lot of what's going on, but we might make conclusions that are in fact um, subject to quite a lot of selection bias. So for example, claims that in the post-Cold War environment, legally binding treaties are no longer a thing, that's largely true for US-led agreements. I would say that's not true for agreements led by smaller states. Second, about why smaller states pursue these agreements, that they don't do so out of altruism or just it's the right thing to do, but they do so for strategic reasons to reshape their relations with great powers. Third, that how they pursue these agreements is not incidental. It's, not also, it's also not the same way that great powers pursue multilateral weapons governance but is important for their ability to create agreements that reflect and advance their goals. And finally, although the content of agreements in different issue areas probably does look quite different, I think there are lessons here for other issue areas. And I'm thinking in particular about climate governance, where we've seen efforts by smaller states to demand multilateral action to limit their vulnerability to the effects of climate change largely caused by major industrial polluters um, and at the same time demand that they have a seat at the table and a role in decision-making about what mitigation and adaptation will look like rather than relying only on major emitters to decide what the future of dealing with climate change will be. So I'll end there. Thanks so much for your time. I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you very much, Naomi. That's um, incredibly interesting and impressive. A piece of research, and I also want to compliment you on just what a clear, well-organized presentation that was. I think a lot of people could learn lessons from how to give a talk from that. Um, so let's open it up for Q&A. We've got about 45 minutes. Um, let me, I see people in the room, but just before I take people in the room, let me make sure that we don't neglect our folks who are um, online. If you are watching on Zoom, um, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little raise hand icon, and I'll ask Caitlin to help me uh, keep track. Is there anybody um, online who has a who has a hand up right now, Caitlin? I do see that um, Elaine White is unmuted. All right. Well, why don't we? Uh, since Elaine was the president of the negotiated <laughs> forum, I think we will um, invoke hierarchy uh, here briefly before we go back to egalitarianism and let, let Elaine have the first comment or question. So go ahead, please, Elaine. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. I actually had not raised my hand, but I intended to do. Can you hear me well? Yes. 
Yes, yes. Oh, good, great, 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 great. So I, um, I couldn't. I mean, I was very happy to um, when I received this invitation, and I had to do whatever was in my schedule to be to be present and to be uh, able to to listen to this presentation because there isn't that much actually, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. Uh, this this work, and I have, of course, several. Um, comments and, and questions, but I would like to, first of all, congratulate you, Naomi. I, I think it is a great contribution to the discussion. And um, I look forward, I don't know, I maybe I did not hear very well if you are going to publish or if there's anywhere I can have access to a, a written version of this great uh, research. Um, let me see what I can do. Maybe I would start by the... Let's say I would start by by saying that I agree with you that um, I, the the reaction to um, to the to the treaty and to the adoption of the treaty by the nuclear weapon states was was very interesting to us. I did not think that within less than an hour or less than two hours after the adoption there was going to be a press a press um, release by. UK, but US, UK, and France. And there was not good, I didn't think it was gonna be so much um, diplomatic effort as you mentioned, as you mentioned. Um, and it actually brings me to the memory of, um, I later on studied what happened with the, with the so-called Irish resolution back in the late fifties when the, when the Irish actually introduced the concepts of non-proliferation banning of, um, uh, of uh, testing and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and further, further engagement in nuclear disarmament efforts. And when the declassification moment came some years ago, we realized how on the, on the part of the US there was resistance and there were, there were these words used of the Irish resolution being disruptive and dangerous. Um, and then we saw how later on uh, when, when there was a new administration and conditions, they, they kept on, on having, on engaging in conversations, in negotiations at the UN. At the end, the Irish resolution was adopted by, by acclamation. So they say in, 50, in 61 and then Later on, we saw how these concepts were in, in, included in. Um, also, the Irish resolution really shaped the conceptual framework of the superpowers in terms of the way to go with a, a, a nuclear regime. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I do, I, I do uh, share that same view of how these these reactions and these actions actually felt on the other side felt more like um, uh, they really raised the, um, the profile of the treaty, just to, to cite uh, one, uh, one example. So um, I think also the, um, the issue of why, of the why, uh, I think the first one I completely agree with you in the sense of um, the need to reduce vulnerability uh, in different uh, in different expressions of vulnerability. Uh, on the issue of a strategic decision to increase agency and influence, I am not sure that that is an independent variable. I think it is. It has evolved. It. it it evolved as countries uh, reacted to non-compliance, to frustration, to uh, to resistance on the on the part of of um, the nuclear weapon states to engage in meaningful in meaningful negotiations, conversations with the non-nuclear weapon states about how they were going to uh, continue on the track that they had started at the end of the Cold War. The, um, that increased uh, frustration, I think, was complemented to put to use one word complemented with other, with other variables. One of them was the I would say the emergence, the emergence of the common interests of humanity, uh, in such a strong manner 
in the global in the global po uh, political agenda. So we have climate change and we have other other uh, aspects that are of common concern of humanity. And in having those common concern common concerns of humanity, uh, all states felt the, the, the call to uh, to engage and to not to leave the solution of the problems in the hands of of, of even just a powerful state. So uh, the fact that we have such a salient um, so, or the increased salience of these common concerns of humanity was again, a, a, I think an empowering, empowering factor as well as a phenomenon that is very difficult to explain, but I need to, I need to mention it. The end of the Cold War meant for the, for the many small states a, an increase in the leverage, in the space, in the national space, in the leverage in sovereignty for pol national policy, uh, foreign uh, national policy making in general, in foreign policy making in particular. So countries felt a little bit more just free to, and just uh, we just started to 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 consider that we had a little bit more leverage to design our foreign policies and national policies overall. I think that also played an important role in the country's feeling that they could confront the, the, the great powers in an area that was so specific and so strategic. Um, and also the belief, also the, the, humanitarian, the humanitarian concerns applied to the nuclear weapons field is something that should not surprise us because the, the, actually the putting the human being at the center of all the um, conceptual frameworks that were developed after the, after the Cold War was, um, was a process that started with, uh, with economics, with development, and then also we had the concept of human security uh, early in the 90s. So most of the countries that were engaged in this process did have a, a very strong belief in, 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 in human security overall, including the human being at the center. So, um, I think that I, I would have a, 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 a different view of um, of the second of the second um, cause that you are presenting in terms of of this increased agency and influence being a strategic decision and rational decision rather than a a a point of arrival of a process that was that was fed by many different. Mm, other processes um, related to the international to the international environment. Last, last but not least, there is an aspect there um, in which you mentioned that we are uh, we were prohibiting a weapon, a kind of weapon that we don't have, and we are not related to. But you know, there's something that's really very interesting besides the fact that we feel that we are connected to the rest of the international community by these common concerns of humanity. There's an aspect that I, I did not think about before, which is the issue of the international financial markets, how they, you know, how they work in terms of uh, providing access to many companies or companies that are related to, the, to, the, to nuclear weapons. Obviously, companies from uh, from um, nuclear weapon states that actually can access the, for instance, pension funds from countries that are nuclear free, and that's a very interesting. That's a very very interesting um, external, let's say, externality, because, for instance, in the case of Costa Rica, who has you know abolished uh, the army and so on and so forth, um, we did not have. A, a, a legal instruments, li instruments, instrument to actually prohibit our pension funds and pension fund operators to actually invest in these, in these kind of companies. And this is something that uh, is a very important contribution, I think, for, uh, for Costa Ricans overall. So I will, I will end, end there. I would maybe have many other uh, comments, but I really want to thank you. I feel very, very happy that you are
undertaking this, this research and let me know where I can find um, the print version. Muchas gracias, uh, Ambassador White. Um, I think maybe also you don't need to respond to, to every single thing there, but, but Elaine teed up several great things. Probably uh, number one, where are you planning to publish? Um, but also, you know, do you want to comment on the comparison with the, the Irish resolution? Um, is your framing maybe overweighting strategic calculation? Uh, you know, I certainly, um, to a large extent, interpreted the TPNW as a expression of great frustration with the lack of progress in Article 6 and maybe fairness concerns, and then um, its role possibly as a financial instrument for, for investment. So any of those that you want to pick from? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for your thoughtful engagement. I really appreciated um, your questions and comments. This is in the process of being turned into a book, so um, it will be a book at some point. Um, I'd be happy to send you the working paper as well. Um, I'll also oh, note... Um, great. I'll also note a related paper I've published, which um, uses the case of the TPNW, but as an example of something different, and that one actually is published, so I think that would be helpful. Um, it's in the European Journal of International Relations, and my co-author and I um, think about the role of small states in revisionism in world politics and use the TPNW as a case of that. And so the concerns about frustration play very much in there, and the idea that um, Smaller states may lack a lot of the tools that IR theory often associates with revisionist endeavors, um, but still pursue endeavors that involve changing the normative consensus on which international order is built. Um, and so the decision to pursue these efforts rather than sort of daily bargaining of international negotiations comes about when existing pathways to progress are blocked um, and when there are examples of progress through other um, areas as well. So I'd be happy to send that to you as well. Um, so on, on this issue of whether agency evolved or whether it was an intentional um, goal from the start, I, I think that's a really important question. It's something I, I want to think more about. So I appreciate you raising that. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'll, I'll just say I, I very much appreciated your comments and, and I'm going to be thinking about that. Um, on the comparison to the Irish resolution, um, you know, one of the things that struck me in this project is how similar some of the reactions are over time across issue, across different types of weapons, different forms of negotiations. And I think the reaction to the Irish resolution and then how it provided this framework for inspiration, but in a, a very different way than what um, the Irish resolution had initially proposed in that it was nego the negotiations were primarily between the two superpowers and eventually taken to other states as well. Um, so sort of how it, it provided that inspiration, but was transformed into a different process of reaching that agreement. Um, I think that's a, that's a helpful comparison there. Um, just very quickly on, on financial markets. Um, yes, I think, I think that's a great point that it does provide for new instruments and new obligations for non-nuclear weapon states. Um, I would note that, and please feel free, free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but my, I would note my understanding is that the TPNW doesn't require that, that that's an additional measure to advance the treaty that state, some states have taken up, but that the treaty would not require all states to do that in order to be in compliance with the treaty. So I saw, um, uh, so I think I saw Avner, uh, then Bill, then Masako, and then after the three of you, we'll go back to whoever else is online. So, uh, Avner. Thank you, Nami. It was a fantastic talk, really lovely, well-organized, well-presented, a, a real pleasure. And I think it's a subject that really deserves a lot of attention, theoretically and empirically, and I think that uh, what you're going to, 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 to add will be a really important contribution. So I'm really grateful. It was fantastic to, to listen. Number of issues, and I try not to be too too long. Uh, I'll start with a terminological issue. You use for all along this 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 word, the word governance. I thought that the common phrase that usually we use in the literature in the conversation is regime, because governance is usually about domestic forms of running affairs and 
at least you should say global governance, but usually in the context of global, I thought it was more appropriate to use regime. So it's just terminological, but they want to do more, more, more substance. What about the responses of the other three? You mentioned the P5. What about the other three? India, Pakistan, Israel, and maybe the fourth, North Korea. Uh, as a matter of anecdote, I can always say that I thought, and it's a long story to explain, but that one of the origins of Israeli opacity is always the feeling we are not really a big power. We do not have the, the, the way to appear ourselves as, as having claims to nuclear weapons. This is something of the big powers. And, and therefore we are always feeling much more modest about it. You know, this was Israel was two million people who started the, the project. So I think there was a difference between the, the other three or other four and, and the P5, which is, I think it's worth talking about. Um, you know, I, I asked you, somewhat interrupting you, but about, about this demarche which seems to be very silly. If you can, if, if you know any extent why the US decided to go to that. It led to no impact whatsoever. It looks, I think, to many silly why they took that kind of actions. And the more broader question is, what is your judgment? You know, it's a retrospect of not many years, maybe six years by now, to the overall impact of this instrument. One thing that I noticed at the time was the ignorance of the media in the West almost entirely. I was looking at the Israeli media, nothing, almost nothing about it. American media, very limited thing as a, something anecdotal, as a something aside. Uh, I think politically overall, the impact was not that much. It's kind of interesting in terms of norms. So what's, what's your, and I think it's very important when you're looking at to try to give assessment of or judgment, which is tentative, I understand that, but what is the overall impact of that enormous work? I mean, it took so many years to go into that. There is a long history. Let me finally, I think the story of the Irish resolution or the Irish proposals in, in the late 50s and that story is, is quite different. First, the Irish resolution, Ireland is, is a northern country, is um, part of the West. It was very much in the context of uh, public opinion, sense of revulsions about the big test that took place at the time, especially the, the final, the last 40 megaton, the, the Soviet test which was for more than 40, 60, 58. Um, and I think the, the, the impact on, on, on the creation of the entity was quite different. And it had impact, but it was changed and all that. So I think the analogy is, 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 is a little problematic and I'm curious about that. Anyway, thanks again. Thank you, Raph. So I think again, that was a long list of, of questions. You can feel free to be selective about which ones you want to address. Okay. Um, so on, I'll start with, with just a few. Um, on governance versus regime, I use the term governance because regime, as I've seen it used and as I, I use it, um, refers to a broader institutional apparatus than is there for a lot of these agreements that um, we talk about. If we talk about the non-proliferation regime, we're talking about a variety of different treaties. We're talking about international organizations and we're talking about domestic legislation as well. Um, and I think that I have some disagreements with how other people use the term the non-proliferation regime and what they count as in or out of that. And so I did not want to replicate that. Um, but I think that governance more accurately for me reflects what the, what the central issue is, that it's about creating restrictions or controls on the possession and use transfer of weapons um, in a way that regime doesn't seem to capture that regime is much more about the institutional apparatus. Um, but, you know, I can understand that not everybody would agree with that. Um, the question about responses of nuclear weapon states outside of the NPT is I think really interesting. Um, I think they did a very good job letting others, letting 
um, the U.S. in particular, but the, the P5 really take the blame or be the target. I would also say I think it's interesting that in the lead up to the TPNW, I don't, my assessment is they weren't really the targets of the TPNW, that it was much more about the states whose possession of nuclear weapons right. was accepted under the NPT. And so these states did a very good job not protesting something hiding. that wasn't really aimed at hiding. Yes, thank you. Um, and that's quite a contrast. Um, finally, um, I'll just on the overall impact of the TPNW, which is it's always a hard question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that there has been some impact that, that we saw the US respond with the CEND initiative. And I think there has been more pressure on the US in particular to respond with something in the area of disarmament. Because it was letters. between ignorance and a little rebuking or putting aside or dismissing, you know, it was somewhere between dismissal and ignorance, I think more. Some statement were given, but essentially it was kind of, who, who are you to talk about this stuff? Yes, although I do think that there has been a stronger US effort to respond with something. Now that's not quantitative reductions in arsenals. Um, that's, diff it's, why I was respond with something I mean diplomatically, but I do think that the war in Ukraine has really framed the question of nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament to a much greater degree. And so we could speculate as to had that not happened with the TPNW had a different impact. I don't know, but I think that um, questions about whether nuclear weapons provide security, whether we really need to get rid of all of them, domestic debates about reductions versus increases about um, future limits has really been largely in the context of um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and threats of nuclear use and not so much about the TPNW. I think it's been quite overshadowed by that. All right, I think I have Bill next on my list. Thank you. I have a variety of, of observations and questions. And first, let me just say, say that it's so uh, wonderful to see you in your current capacity, having been uh, along with Masako, uh, you know, privileged to have you uh, a long time ago uh, as an undergraduate here. And it's also great to see Elaine on the screen here. I remember not uh, that many years ago when Elaine was also giving a presentation after she spent the summer here, reflecting on her own experiences uh, as the president of the uh, TPW. And, and she was here before as a graduate and student. A graduate <laughs> as well. So a few points. First of all, um, I don't think it's, I think the process in, uh, that you identify in a, in a variety of places, which you did in a superb fashion, is actually messier, much messier yeah. than, than you've suggested here. Um, you know, it, it's the case that while numerically the small and medium powers uh, may wish to have votes on issues because of their numerical superiority, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, the NPT, for example, or you look at the CD, uh, it's as much the uh, smaller and medium states that don't want uh, to have uh, voting uh, because uh, in fact, their numbers are, are less homogeneous than might be expected. And whether you're talking about NAM or even you know, regional uh, groupings. And so I think there's not a sharp divide between uh, the large or nuclear weapon states, nuclear weapons possessors, and uh, the smaller states in terms of their preference. They, 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 there are moments when they prefer voting and there are moments when they uh, you know, rely upon consensus uh, to get their uh, positions uh, across. Um, I think it's really important not to attach too much linearity to uh, the failure of the 2015 conference and uh, the uh, outcome of the uh, TPNW. Uh, it was not at all, I think, preordained after you had the three international conferences that we would end up with a TPNW. In fact, many people uh, you know, might have argued that you were more likely to see a push for a nuclear weapons convention. But it was the fact that the nuclear weapons states, although they attended the, the last uh, TPNW meeting in Vienna in 2014, didn't show up at the open-ended working group. Uh, in, uh, in Geneva. And so I remember uh, the Mexican uh, diplomat 
basically saying if they're not here uh, to uh, you know articulate their views, uh, then the only alternative is for us to move in the direction uh, of the TPNW, and, and, and that's in fact what transpired. I think it's also really important. We may even talk about this when you are you know, working on your dissertation, but for the you know the larger audience here, I think there were I think civil society uh, deserves an even greater shout out than, than, than you provided here. And civil society though was supported particularly by the Norwegians and, and some other countries. This was not something that happened overnight. They funded a number of major research projects that provided uh, some of the theoretical uh, backbone or framework for what you saw develop, particularly at the open-ended working group. And that's still uh, the area that is least well-developed. I mean, even Alexander Kamen, who's written the authoritative book on the subject, he wasn't present at the open-ended working group. And so if you weren't there, you, you miss, I think, to some extent, the way in which uh, ICANN and was able to mobilize, particularly the, the African states and the Latin American countries, who really played an essential role uh, in influencing, in my view, uh, the outcome of, of that, particular, uh, that particular gathering. And finally, I'll just note uh, that um, uh, the, uh, there, there's not also the homogeneity among uh, the uh, nuclear weapon states with respect to their attitudes toward uh, the TPNW. Even before Ukraine, the United States uh, was not prepared to see uh, a consensus at, or the lack of a consensus final document at a review conference when we were thinking about the one in 2020 go down the tubes because of the TPNW. Maybe the French and the Russians had a different view, but that was not the view of the US. And it's striking at the review conference that was held last August that TPNW was not a, the major issue for most countries. Even the, you know, the French were not prepared to obstruct a consensus final document based upon that issue. Yeah, my own view uh, was that there was actually far more debate about gender issues. It was far more <laughs> contentious, no, seriously, uh, far more contentious at the review conference and the debate over uh, the TPNW. So those are just some kind of observations that you can ignore or reflect upon if you <laughs> But thanks so much. It really uh, was a marvelous presentation. I'm, I'm so glad you did the research and look forward to the book that comes out. Thank you, Bill. And I'm, I'm going to reinforce one of your questions. So I had written down three questions and, and Elaine hit one, Africa hit one, and you hit the third. But I was particularly interested in the civil society part. So let me, uh, among the things you choose to respond to, I'd love to hear your response to that one. Sure. Well, thank you, Bill. I would never ignore your comments and questions because as always, they are very, they're spot on. Um, and I say this, this is not as a cop out, but as acknowledging challenges in research in that you're of course right that the process is much messier than I laid out. Um, one of my goals in this research is to develop a framework that can travel across different types of weapons, different time periods, and different negotiations. And so it involves a certain level of abstraction that is that is necessarily going to miss a lot of the nuance. So, But at the same time, I, I take your point that there's no need to excessively oversimplify for that purpose. And so to think more about where contingency and nuance um, can come in more where it still is not explaining only the TPNW and can travel, but, but acknowledging more of the contingency and nuance. And I certainly don't mean to suggest that, oh, they did this and then they did this and all of a sudden there was this wonderful treaty. Um, so I, I appreciate that point, um, which you made a little bit more elegantly than I just did. <laughs> Um, on the civil society question, I, I am aware that this is a contentious thing to say. I think the role of civil society is often overemphasized. Um, and so I, 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 I'm getting there. <laughs> um, I think that I can certainly played an important role, but civil society organizations don't negotiate agreements. They don't ratify them. Their participation and their consent is not required. And so None of that is to in any way diminish the important role in building support, in framing the issue, in providing sort of the ideas behind. But I think that some of that has sometimes slipped into, it was 
it was them who came up with the agreement in a way that I think sometimes really diminishes the role of a lot of um, Latin American, African, and Pacific states in, um, in developing these agreements. So you're right that I, I really didn't talk about civil society at all, and cert civil society certainly played a role in the treaty. I think that I, my view is that um, the participation of smaller states was, was critical in a way that the role of civil society was not. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, while we're chewing on that, uh, Masako, I saw you had your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. It's so good to see you, and I'm just so impressed by your presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. And actually, what I really wanted to mention is the civil society, but I have uh, some comment on what you just said about mm -hmm. civil society. I may have a slightly different perspective. I really value. I also feel like uh, civil, the role of a civil society tends to be under estimated so I uh, know yeah so because uh, to me this the uh, and other is the one of the best example of the uh, collaboration between civil society and the like minded small countries so I really believe that the role of civil society as a um, perhaps a, a better uh, bigger than uh, many people but, but but that's my perspective and uh, actually my Question maybe slightly digress from your main thing, but uh, when uh, we look at the history of nuclear weapons, this nuclear disarmament, uh, like, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, while when <laughs> Ambassador from Costa Rica is in existence, you know, the Nuclear Weapons Convention um, uh, uh, proposed by Costa Rica and uh, Malaysia in 1997, and also revised version in 2007. And also, uh, International Court of Justice uh, advisor opinion in 1996. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are so many histories and a lot of efforts. But uh, those efforts, uh, perhaps uh, TPNW, maybe the uh, result of all the accumulated uh, uh, historical efforts. Mm -hmm. That maybe uh, the time is right. right. Mm -hmm. But uh, in but whenever I think about the history of nuclear disarmament, why such a treaty didn't come early, early America? Why, what's your view on why, like for example, even 2007, um, uh, revised version of a nuclear weapons convention, why it was not so successful, especially in terms of engaging in smaller countries and then, then I must say that why civil society was important around that time, IPPNW, you know, the mm -hmm. mother of uh, ICAM, mm -hmm. uh, created the ICAM because uh, uh, IPPNW realized, okay, we have to do something new. So that's why I really think uh, the role of the civil society is a really big one in nuclear disarmament history. Of course, that's my, I, I don't mind. <laughs> 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 I'm a strong support of the civil society. <laughs> but, but basically, I want to know what you think about the why the past, you know, like 2007 and 1996, 1997, such efforts were not successful as we have seen for the 2017 success? Yes, thank you. And I recognize that saying the role of civil society is sometimes overplayed is a very contentious statement <laughs> here in particular, given all the incredible work that CNS has done to advance non-proliferation and disarmament efforts. Um, so let me... Let me attempt to, <laughs> to restate that a little bit. Um, I think that there's been a lot of really excellent work on the role of civil society. And so, so it's interesting for me to hear you say that you think it is underplayed. Um, because I, I would say that of the things that I read, I, I see a sort of civil society and, and yes, yeah, states did something too. Um, and I think that that is not an, not how I see it. Um, I do think that civil society is really important in the process of getting to an agreement, in the process of building the support, in the process of getting states to care about this in the first place, and in the process of keeping that pressure on, including the pressure for ratification. Um, I think that though when we look more historically, this involvement of civil society is largely a post-Cold War phenomenon, not entirely. Um, not entirely, for sure. But 
more of a post-Cold War phenomenon. And then so trying to develop a framework that explains the existence of these agreements, which cannot exist without state participation um, in a way that covers, that can apply, you know, all theories apply more or less to different cases. And so there will always be cases where this doesn't apply, um, but that applies not just to the post-Cold War period. I think that um, the emphasis on civil society becomes less as we look more broadly at different types of agreements and over a period of time. Bill? <laughs> no, I, I yes, yeah, but if, if I may just kind of weigh in on, on one point, because there was something I think, uh, again, this, this is the generalization that I'm a little bit concerned about here. Mm -hmm. I think there was something very special about uh, the open ended working group. Uh, and that was that civil society had a seat at the table in a fashion that they don't have at, in the MPT review process, that they don't have at the CD. But it, is re it resembles the situation that existed uh, when you had the negotiation of the cluster munitions, mm -hmm. small arms, or the landmines uh, you know, convention. And so uh, I don't want to exaggerate. I, I'm the last person really who, who would exaggerate the role of civil society, but it really depends on the specifics. And uh, one reads well, and so I think the the nature of the meetings that were held in Geneva in the lead up to the General Assembly resolution and in the actual negotiation of the TPNW was really important because of the presence. Uh, at the table with a, a right to ask questions to speak, which is not typical in the general nuclear disarmament sector. I think that made a difference. And that sort of gave uh, some power to ICON and other parties who could point to the young people that they brought to the meeting. Who otherwise, I mean, in the NPT uh, you know, uh, review conference, where you have you know, four weeks of meetings and you have maybe two hours that are set aside for civil society, everybody has six to seven minutes to talk, and most of the delegates aren't even present. That was very different than what you saw in Geneva. So I think it was a special case. That would be the point that I would make. Not to pile on here, but I would also say that you can actually go back to the 19th century for examples of, of civil society involvement. Like the original Hague conventions, you know, included being pushed and promoted from, from the, the 19th century version of civil society. You know, actors. But um, I don't know, if you had a great question about why why did it take so long? It didn't come earlier. So, uh, you know, Naomi, if you have a chance to respond to that, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, and and thank you both. I appreciate the additional recognition of nuance in in the way that civil society has participated. Um, why why ne now? A few years ago. <laughs> um, I don't think there is one definitive factor that made it that particular time. Um, I think it was a confluence of a lot of, a lot of things. Um, I think, you know, I tend to not like using the word frustration because I think sometimes it diminishes the seriousness of um, these claims. But I do think that these repeated efforts being blocked um, yeah. as well as the examples though of going outside of the CCW in landmines and in cluster munitions, the combination of that provided a really powerful idea that this can be done in a different way. And if the TPNW didn't, wasn't quite the same format as landmines and cluster munitions. Um, but I think it was this powerful example of there is an alternative combined with this, we keep trying this and it's not working. Um, you know, why this particular year and why that repeated frustration, which existed well before 1997, didn't occur then, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we can, we can think about sort of the right combination of motivated diplomats and the right opportunity structure push from civil society, um, sort of factors, other factors that might be specific to, to what was going on right then. Um, but but yeah, I mean, sometimes I, I look back at sort of earlier efforts and think, well, why didn't that work? Um, so there's, yeah. Well, Bill gave, gave some of the story. I mean, the, the specific circumstances that, that led to that at that mm -hmm. particular point mm -hmm. yeah. in Mexico and you know various specific issues. Mm -hmm. I think we may have time for one more question. Caitlin, is anybody else online? We do. Um, Hannah Harris has. Oh, great. Okay, so um, Hannah, do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> 
Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, my name is Hannah Harris. I'm a current student in the Ms. Gimo dual degree in NPTS. And I think I had one question when the Q&A started and now I have like 50, but um, two really <laughs> quick, I guess. Um, the first is uh, from your slides, I was really interested in what you shared about reframing and the framing of weapons in general. And is there anything you've observed through your work about kind of like future trends in how we're framing weapons or any issues that you see? For example, um, NATO and all five nuclear weapon states have different definitions for strategic and non-strategic. So I, there's, there's no shared definitions. And I wonder like what you see as being a good way forward to combat that. And then second, really quickly, since uh, civil society came up, um, I'm writing my thesis right now and it's on science diplomacy with North Korea. And one of the points that I'm exploring is how um, in uh, circumstances where civil society was disempowered, for example, the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea, scientific society was able to empower itself and foster greater international ties with other countries. So for example, the International Astronomical Union, which is like the, the IAEA of astronomy, we were able to use science diplomacy to keep ties with the USSR when civil society was not able to promote it. Uh, we were able to bring China back into the IAU as a member state using science diplomacy. And we've also maintained ties with North Korea, even though their civil society is probably one of the most disempowered on earth. So, um, so there's really interesting. Uh, thank you everyone for your comments and thank you, Ambassador White. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for those questions. Um, I'll just take them in order. Um, yeah, questions about reframing. Um, you know, one thing that I find really interesting is in the CCW negotiations going on, sorry, I shouldn't say negotiations, talks in the CCW about autonomous weapons. I am really struck by how similar these debates are to the 1970s, um, for better or for worse, um, in which questions about, is it an inherent nature of a technology or weapon that or is it about proper use? Is it about new legally binding agreements or are existing laws of war enough and we need to just implement them properly? And so um, one thing that I, I think a lot about in framing and reframing is that frames generally draw on existing frames or they're linked to existing frames in other ways. And this is not just me, this is um, Richard Price has some really excellent work on this, um, but that frames don't sort of appear out of nowhere generally, they're generally tied to other frames and other ideas about relationships between things we're concerned about. Um, so I don't have um, a solution on how to resolve the differences between what's strategic and non-strategic, but, but I would look, I guess, to what, what other ideas they're linked to as well. Um, your project sounds really, really interesting on science diplomacy and thinking about this question of when civil society has been disempowered, but science diplomacy is, is still empowered. I think that's, that's a fascinating topic to explore. Um, you know, one of the things that I think really worries me right now is the extent to which that has become really difficult in the US domestic political context and science diplomacy and thinking about the US-China relationship. Um, and so I don't have, I wish I had solutions. Um, <laughs> they're hard questions. Um, but I think that, you know, that's, that's something to think about sort of what are the similarities and differences between what we're seeing now in that context versus past examples. Um, you know, Pugwash is I think a really ex interesting example um, and sort of the conditions within the Soviet Union that allowed Pugwash to exist and engage in the way that it did um, and sort of, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but a really interesting project and look forward to learning what you find. Great. Well, I think we're probably uh, out of time at this point, but um, thank you again, Naomi, and, and please join me in thanking our speaker for a really fascinating presentation.